A nefarious nightmare contains themes that may be explicit or triggering for some. Specific warnings and disclaimers will be mentioned in the show notes. A nefarious nightmare assumes all parties that are mentioned in these cases to be innocent unless proven guilty in a court of law. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to Season 4. 30-year-old Jennifer Doherty was a sweet, caring woman who was brutally tortured and then murdered in the early hours of February 11th, 2010. Jennifer wanted nothing more than to love and be loved. Her trusting nature and sweet disposition unfortunately made her a target for the Greensburg Six. Join us as we dive into the gruesome events that led to the murder of Jennifer Doherty. This two-part series is a revision of an episode we originally aired, which was January 9th of 2022. Wolfpack of Greensburg, the murder of Jennifer Doherty. With that, I'm Courtney Fenner. And I'm Amanda Cronin. And a nefarious nightmare presents... Her light continues to shine. The murder of Jennifer Doherty, part one. To start... An explanation. We are going through some of our episodes and doing revisits, and we originally aired Wolfpack of Greensburg in January of last year. Now, that episode was something I had worked extra hard on, given the fact that I was really learning more about things like audio quality at the time. But, you know, we were just beginning to format our episodes differently. And although I so desperately wanted a better result from that episode, it did not meet my own expectations. I'd spent close to 40 hours on editing, mastering, and producing that episode and adding in so much unnecessary banter. So the lesson I learned from that is sometimes less is more. And also that extra unnecessary things will take away from the value of getting a story out there that needs to be told. The story of Jennifer Doherty continuously haunts me to this day. And while my intent was to drive home the fact that she did not deserve any of the brutality that was given to her, and how we all need to protect especially vulnerable people like her. I also needed to learn and have learned to take my own self out of the equation and tell it from a more empathetic standpoint. With that, we wanted to do better and be better with this case. I will warn you all ahead of time though, that the people that did what they did to make both Amanda and I rage with fury, um, it's very prevalent in this episode and we are unapologetic about that. So you may very well hear our anger and snark and heartbreak, and we will not even try to minimize that because what happened to Jennifer is absolutely sick and vile, and you'd have to be disgusting to do such things to a human being. Jennifer Lee Doherty was born in Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania on November 8th, 1979 to Father Richard Doherty of Pittsburgh and Mother Denise Murphy. At the time of Jennifer's passing, she had a stepfather, Bobby Murphy, also of Mount Pleasant. Jennifer was described as a kind and loving person who wanted nothing more than to have friends and care deeply about people. She had a very easy time making friends, too. Those close to her said that people warmed up to her really quickly. One thing to note here, and it is an important fact to know about this case, is that Jennifer had a fairly significant mental disability, and it was described that as a 30-year-old woman, she had more of the mentality and maturity of a 12 to 14-year-old. While she had this mentality, she still was the kind of person who wasn't out looking for trouble. You know how you have adolescents who are rebellious and will they'll just do anything to rebel. And then on the other side, you have the adolescents who typically preferred being sweet and also had the sense to stay out of trouble. You know, like they would doodle little hearts and flowers all over their notebooks, and they just generally had this innocent disposition about them. And that was Jennifer. This is to show you that the murder that took place, as is all murders that take place, was absolutely senseless. And they all truly are. 
But when you hear us dive into this case, you'll understand the significance of that and what happened. Before we continue, I will go on record to say that some of the offenders had dealt with trauma and abuse and what have you growing up. However, we're not going to dive too deep into that because the intent here is to not dissuade you into seeing all the brutality of the crime. So as to not distract from this crime, the point is to have empathy for Jennifer and her family and friends that loved her. Now, we will give some details, but this isn't about the Greensburg Six and their upbringing. This is to raise more awareness about the victim, Jennifer Doherty. Jennifer Doherty's last official words to her parents were a note she left, not the suicide note you will hear about later on. Remember that, by the way, as there are a couple of notes mentioned throughout, but a note she left prior to meeting up with her friends that said, quote, Mom, I hope you have a good day at work. I love you very much. I will talk to you sometime later. Love, Jennifer. End quote. Jennifer was especially close with her parents, and they were keen to the fact that all Jennifer truly wanted was to be independent, and they basically gave her free reign to do so and to do what she wished as she was an adult. But they did take over her personal and important things such as her finances, which was smart because being someone who's easy to take advantage of, she absolutely needed that backing. So it wasn't exactly a conservatorship, but... At the same time, it kind of was, and it was actually necessary. This isn't to compare to the Britney Spears debacle. Unlike Britney, she had a documented intellectual disability. So unfortunately, those who have had these intellectual disabilities tend to be a lot more vulnerable to predators, people who set out to hunt for people that can be easily taken advantage of. One thing is that according to several people, Jennifer trusted everyone and just wanted to be liked. This would unfortunately paint a big giant target on her back for predators. And unfortunately, it did, as you are about to hear. A well-established, or meaning he had conducted thousands of autopsies of homicide victims, but a well-established forensic pathologist and also a former coroner by the name of Cyril H. Wecht of Allegheny, he said, quote, this is one of the most horrific cases I have seen. You have one young defenseless woman and six people who are keeping her captive and doing all these things, knowing she's mentally challenged. Put it all together. It is bizarre. It is extreme barbarism. End quote. We were sort of chatting with Sabrina Thompson, the person who kind of reminded Courtney and I of this case, which I had on our list for some time. And we all agreed that Jennifer and Justin Barnyard would have made wonderful friends. At the time of this recording, that episode is still up, but we do intend on revisiting that. This case, as well as Justin's, draw a lot of parallels, being that these were two kind-hearted people who just wanted to live and love and be loved in return, but were defenseless and had their lives stolen from them. The one difference is that Arguably, the brutality of the crimes committed against Jennifer is a bit worse due to the nature of what happened and her disability. And while all crimes to this degree are awful, and even if one is worse than another, the degree to which is worse is extremely slight. So Jennifer had mentioned to her parents that she had made a group of new friends over in Greensburg. According to her stepfather, she would go to the bus and head to her doctor appointments and whatnot in Greensburg, which was about 10 miles from Mount Pleasant, where they lived. She would also visit a community center around there, and it was here where she made this group of friends. The first one being Peggy Miller. February 10th of 2010, she told her mother and stepfather that she was going to her friend's apartment in Greensburg to sleep over, and it was like a slumber party. Her plan was to stay the night, go to her doctor appointment the next morning and head back home to Mount Pleasant. That morning, she left a note with the above official last words and also contact information so the parents knew how to get a hold of her. The last time her parents saw her alive was when her stepdad dropped her off at the bus station. He had given her a kiss on the forehead and said goodbye. According to Morbidology, where we did get some of this information, so thank you to Emily Thompson for your article on this, Jennifer's mother, Denise, stated that her biggest regret was forcing her daughter to be an adult. 
To which I say, Denise did nothing wrong. She was trying to do right by her daughter. Jennifer then heads over to Ricky Smyrne's apartment where everyone, which would be the Greensburg Six, were. Jennifer evidently knew Angela Marinucci for quite some time, and they even used to chat on the phone often. Unfortunately, these people were not really Jennifer's friends, so who are the Greensburg Six? The first one we will get into is Ricky Smyrne's. It's said that Smyrne's was raped by his dad and uncle at a young age. His mom was a sex worker, which, let me be clear, just because someone's a sex worker does not make them bad people. But the life of a sex worker can be pretty rough depending on the nature of the sex work. And his dad was a gangbanger. Smyrns was tossed around foster homes and he had tried heroin, weed, cocaine, and alcohol at the age of six. And was also receiving treatment for mental health at four. He was diagnosed with PTSD at eight. In his entire life, he suffered abuse and neglect until at the age of 10, the Smyrns family adopted him. His lawyer also mentioned that he, quote, had undergone 103 therapy sessions by age 10. And she added that he was diagnosed as having as many as seven different personalities and 15 total psychiatric issues, end quote. Growing up, Smyrns had already had burglary and sexual assault charges, where in 1997, evidently he was 11 years old at this time, but he was born in 86. He had stolen weapons, cash, and guitars from a neighbor, and that same year he had sexually assaulted a woman in her basement. Smyrns was known to be a predator to those vulnerable. He took advantage of a lot of people. The next one is Angela Marinucci. Now, she suffered a head injury when she was hit by a truck in 2008 at the age of 15, according to testimony by her mother and half-sister. The injury, quote, substantially altered her behavior and pushed her into a downward spiral that ended with Doherty's death. And sure, you know, that's why she did it. Two mental experts testified that Marinucci, as a child, suffered from depression, and that she may have had a drug and alcohol problem as a teenager. She was in a relationship with Smyrns and she hates Jennifer like she hates her because she's jealous and it's a quote unquote love triangle. She's been inviting Jennifer to spend weekends with her and Smyrns with his phone, basically tricking Jennifer, told someone that she was quote, going to kill that bitch, end quote. And then there's Peggy Miller who was actually the first friend Jennifer made at a community center. She was waiting at a bus station for Jennifer. Robert Masters was Miller's fiance and was also at the bus station. And then Melvin Knight. He met Smyrns in prison. There is a slight background, but he fell from a moving vehicle when he was five, suffering a significant brain injury that could maybe contribute to serial killer impulse control issues and was also a victim of abuse at the hands of his father. And finally, Amber, who was Knight's pregnant girlfriend. Jennifer did also become friends with Peggy, and while we don't know the backstory of how that all came about, we do know that Jennifer and Angela Marinucci had been friendly for a while. I do believe that Jennifer had met Smyrns through her and was given the wrong impression, being that Smyrns you know, made her believe that he wanted her while being in a relationship with Marinucci at the same time. Basically, it's a bunch of Jerry Springer drama that unfortunately involves Jennifer, who was impressionable and super trusting. Jennifer is under the impression that she and Smyrns are going to get married, and she tells Medinger this. Marinucci overhears this, she becomes angry, and Jennifer leaves at some point, and Marinucci and Smyrns are seen holding hands. According to Emma Kinney, who is a true crime YouTuber and psychologist out of the UK, Smyrns is basically playing these two women and really just acting like a fuckboy. This is what is reported after the fact. It all seemed to have gone down when it was all believed that Jennifer tried to seduce Smyrns. What's probably more likely, given how Jennifer really was, was that she was just trying to snuggle him or give him a hug that or that she was given the wrong impression and nobody bothered to correct her for that. But it was perceived differently because Smyrn's other girlfriend was jealous. Remember? Marinucci? 
kind of reminds me of some high school drama that occurs even today with full-grown adults in their mid to late 30s with big egos who assume that a friendly and loving person with genuinely good gestures are flirtatious and out to get everyone. (laughs) I mean, I don't know about you all, but personally, I believe the hat doesn't always fit, but sometimes people like to force the hat to fit. But I digress. On to the next page. But Smyrne's story is that Jennifer came on to him. He rejected her because he wasn't interested, despite the fact that he was telling her he wanted to marry her. Next, he rejected her advances defensively. My thought is that if you are defensive when someone accuses you of lying, for example, that means you're very likely guilty of lying. So basically, he was defensive when he rejected her advances because he had been caught doing something. The next morning, like every morning, she's supposed to go to the doctor to, I guess, get her medication or for an appointment of some kind. It's not clear. So for whatever reason, she decides not to go. And the fact that she did not leave really angers both Smyrns and Knight. This really pissed them both off. And They get into an argument with her about it, so it's almost as if she was set up to fail because they knew she had a disability working against her, and then their mind kind of goes to the place where this is all her fault, even though it's clearly not. Jennifer later goes to take a shower, and while she's in the shower, Smyrns calls Marinucci and basically throws Jennifer under the bus, telling her that Jennifer is coming on to him and making Jennifer out to be this homewrecker. He's perpetrating full-on gossip and rumors to someone who is already not liking Jennifer. Someone who's already jealous of Jennifer and feels threatened by her. But Jennifer was not trying to steal anyone's man. And she was literally a victim of a two-timing asshat and super confused. She did nothing wrong. Now, listening to Emma Kenny talk about this, um, I've gleaned something because she's telling it from a psychological standpoint. If it were true that he truly was the quote-unquote victim and that he had warded off her advances, then Marinucci probably wouldn't have been near as furious as she was when they talked because he had notably done shit like this before. Don't forget that he's a cheating and two-timing prick. And, you know, Marinucci knows this and she chose to stick around. So instead of being at ease that he was quote-unquote honest with her, because you know he wasn't. She turned from a little troll-like figure to this big, giant, green-eyed, furious monster, like so rage-filled and all. Ain't no bitch gonna take my man. That kind of personality. Like, again, back to Jerry Springer. This is a literal Jerry Springer episode. I mean, absolutely no disrespect to Jennifer or her family here, because this is not about her, I'm saying that. Full offense. The Greenberg Six are all the equivalent to anybody that shows up on Jerry Springer. And even worse than that, all six of these people that did what they did to Jennifer, so they start bullying her. They start light, you know, because obviously you have to ease your victim in, groom them as it were, by taking her handbag, stealing her money, her gift cards, clothing items, Then they douse her items with mouthwash. And meanwhile, she's scared and vulnerable and likely confused. Yeah, and she probably felt super powerless and afraid to defend herself. So then they start hitting her. They're hitting her in the head with full Coke bottles. And then she's getting even more scared. Like fight or flight kicks in and she's starting to defend herself, which good for her. But unfortunately... It's kind of a lose-lose situation for her because Knight doesn't like this. And, you know, how dare you fuck up the fun they're having with you? You know, that's his thought process in this. So Knight ups the ante and basically grabs her, throws her up against the wall and chokes her. And all of this is just incredibly cruel. I'm sorry. It's just cruel. So he finally releases her. She drops to the floor, crying hysterically. And here is where I want to remind everyone before I continue. Jennifer is a trusting, loving, vulnerable 30-year-old woman with a mental disability that would make her a mental immaturity level of that of a 12 to 14-year-old. Imagine a 12 to 14-year-old in this situation. Imagine being threatened by a 12 to 14-year-old 
in such a way that you have to take violent acts just to get your point across. You can't imagine it, can you? No. And 12 to 14 year olds, let's not deny it, they can be assholes. But Jennifer was not. She was sweet, loving, deeply cared about people, naive and innocent. She was trusting and she was vulnerable. She has zero issue with anyone there and doesn't understand why any of this is happening and is likely very terrified. So from here, it escalates again. Marinucci then arrives at his apartment. She's pissed and wants to come over to get her boyfriend and also wants revenge. She's confrontational with Jennifer and Jennifer's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Marinucci doesn't like that answer and then looks to Knight and Smurns and I guess for validation or permission, I, I don't know, but I guess it's wolf pack type behavior. Then Amber Medinger then joins Marinucci and the both of them drag Jennifer to a bathroom to continue the assault. Marinucci then pushes Jennifer into a metal shower rod into the walls and into the tiles of this bathroom, causing injury to her head and her chest. Jennifer is vigorously proclaiming her innocence the entire time, but it goes ignored basically. She even keeps stating that she has zero interest in Smyrns, but Marinucci isn't having it because up to this point, she's been festering into this fantasy of coming in like a Viking or something, adventuring her man boy. She doesn't care at this point what's true or what's not because in her mind, she has already accepted the belief that people are out to steal her man and that people should never accept otherwise. All right, imagine for a minute having a gut feeling. You are dead set on believing that this gut feeling would be true and you will stop at nothing to prove your gut is right. Even when scientific evidence point out that it's wrong, and even when it has clearly been produced that the facts do not align with what your gut is saying, you are still steadfast in what your gut says. And that's exactly what's going on here, except way more violent. They are stubborn in their conviction that Jennifer is this monster who is lying, even though it's clearly them. Marinucci had already made up her mind that she was going to do to Jennifer, so in Marinucci's mind, how dare Jennifer challenge that? So Marinucci then starts a game of broken telephone and tells Metadinger, who is dating Knight and also pregnant with his child, that Jennifer wants Knight and pretty much every man that crosses her path. At this point, Metadinger is upset, so now her and Marinucci are now allies in this fight against Jennifer and the man stealer. Like they straight up have a bond and sisterhood now, you know, in the fight against innocent Jennifer. Trust me. Jennifer did not want her man. Nobody but her wanted that. Jennifer was not the type to dig into dumpsters to find men if you catch my drift. Unfortunately, none of them are convinced and Menninger is now pissed and threatened because she believes Marinucci's manipulation and lies. Jennifer continues to protest and state her innocence and she's repaid in violence each time. She continuously pushed into the metal towel rack and her head is injured. Knight then comes back in and drags Jennifer into the living room. At one point, it's been mentioned that they all grab various things like oatmeal and spices and stuff from the spice rack and start pouring it all over her head. Jennifer is saying that her eyes are burning. They tell her that she stinks and force her to take a shower, essentially fashioning her as their puppet. Some time goes by and a former tenant of the apartment that Smyrns lived in by the name of Robert Cathcart, um, who had let Smyrns and the others live there as long as they did some work around the house and chores and all that. Uh, he made a phone call to Smyrns saying that he was coming to grab some items that he had left. She could have been freed from this, y'all. Please note that. She could have been let free, y'all, but she was not. At this point, Jennifer could have been freed. But instead, they shoved her down to the basement. So Cathart shows up and an altercation breaks out between him, Knight, and Smyrns. The police get called and they show up. There was unfortunately no cause for the police to enter and search the apartment. So they basically came by and said, y'all shut up, quit disturbing the peace, 
people are trying to sleep. If you're going to beat the shit out of people, do it more quietly. The police didn't actually say that. That's just how I envision how that scenario went. This is all infuriating because this was Jennifer's chance to essentially be saved from all of this. Is She'd already been brutally assaulted to pulp by these people, but instead they were unfortunately clever enough to hide her and also incredibly lucky at this point that the police didn't come in to look around. It's so infuriating. And once the police and Cathcart left and things started to calm down, Knight and Smurns get bored and they decided that they weren't done with Jennifer. They drug her out of the basement and force her to take her pajamas off. They then throw her pajamas out onto the roof and then grab a pair of scissors and they cut her hair right down to the scalp in some parts. And it's absolutely fucking horrific. They had taken her integrity and also her personal identity. They were saying that they were in complete control. They were the puppeteer at this point and she was unfortunately their puppet. They also make her clean up the mess. This entire time she's asking, why are you doing this to me? They respond with, because you're ugly and no one's ever going to want you. It's incredibly heart-wrenching. Knight then drags Jennifer into the living room, stuffs a sock in her mouth, and brutally sexually assaulted her. His pregnant girlfriend, Meddinger, who evidently has a problem with Jennifer now because of what Marinucci said to her earlier, She comes down and sees this happening and just walks away. At one point, Smyrns and Knight leave because Marinucci needs her medication from her parents' house. They employ Miller and Masters to keep an eye on Jennifer while they're gone and make sure that she doesn't leave. So while they're gone, it's been said that Robert Masters did go and get clothes for Jennifer at one point, that he did show as much compassion as he was allowed to show because Everyone is being influenced under this pack mentality and manipulation. Peggy Miller sees this and contacts the other four as they leave Marinucci's house and basically snitches on Jennifer saying she was trying to leave. It's unclear as to whether she was really trying to leave or not, but regardless, Peggy unfortunately complied with the tasks of being a watchdog. Smyrns and Knight run back to the apartment now that they have this warning and confront Jennifer and then beat her up again. They then force her to take some of Marinucci's meds. They then tell her it's headache medication, but it's actually Seroquel, which is an antipsychotic used to treat BPD or schizophrenia, and also Zoloft, which is an antidepressant. They left Jennifer alone in the room and all went to bed because brutally assaulting someone really takes a lot of out of you. Also, for those of you listening and nitpicking every little thing we say, that's sarcasm. I can't believe we have to tell you that, but there it is. The truth is, you have to be a special kind of fucked up to feel like these people are victims. We're going to go ahead and wrap this up here because this story is very long and detailed, so it does come in two parts. In part two, we will finish up with everything else that Jennifer Doherty had to endure as well as brief details of the trial, the conclusion, and any relevant updates, as well as our final thoughts. With a case like this, we won't hold back from telling you how we feel, and we won't apologize for it. So please be warned, because none of it is pretty. Before we wrap up part one of this horrific case, please don't forget to join our Patreon for bonus content, such as our Not So Nefarious Criminals podcast. Each week, we have a guest, and we always forget. We talk about the lighter side of crime, such as Florida Man. It's a great palate cleanser. We will also try our best, if we can find it, to have the original episode up. The Wolf Pack of Greensburg. The murder of Jennifer Dockery, since it was the original episode. Despite the fact that Courtney worked hard on it, we weren't happy with it, and had a lot of complaints about it, so we'll be absolutely leaving that off the public feed. Just a friendly reminder that we will be at the 2023 True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival in Austin, Texas. That will be August 25th through 27th. We are so excited. We cannot wait to see you. Yes, even you and you and also you. (laughs) That was so silly. But anyway, there will be a ton of great people there and you do not want to miss out. It's so much fun and you get to be around advocates as well as paranormal and ethical true crime creators and you'll even get to listen to some great speakers. Tickets are for sale at truecrimepodcastfestival.com and we will have stuff to give away. 
Like everyone we cover on this podcast, Jennifer Doherty and her family and friends are all bees. Jennifer absolutely fits this narrative, and you will definitely see it in both this part and in part two. She was taken advantage of, bullied, and brutally tortured. It is up to us as humans to protect bees, not harm them or be complicit in harming them. Victims and survivors like bees are resilient, strong, yet vulnerable. We need bees to survive. We thrive in life. We needed Jennifer's light to continue to illuminate the world, and we will not allow her light to dim. We continue to keep Jennifer's memory alive, and her light will shine brighter each and every single day. Jennifer Doherty was a bee, and without bees, we as humans are doomed. So always be vigilant for when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. Music used in the theme was originally recorded by Ghost Stories Incorporated, remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional background music is provided by Epidemic Sound. A Nefarious Nightmare is scripted, researched, and produced by Courtney Finner and Amanda Cronin. This podcast is a Cloud 10 podcast managed by Sim Sarna, Sahiba Krieger, and Jamie Rice of Murderish and Dirty Money Moves. You can help us grow our show by leaving us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Or you can join our Patreon for lighthearted bonus content. Thank you, and as always, be vigilant.